Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done on this earth as it is in heaven. Lord, make us instruments in your hands by which your will will be done on this earth. We have the bread of life before us, the word of God. Help us to rightly divide this word of truth. Come and dwell with us in the person of your Holy Spirit, granting us a deep understanding of your word, an understanding that will bring us nearer and nearer to you. As for me, Lord, please put your words in my mouth that I may speak blessings to all who are listening. In Jesus' name I have prayed. Amen. That I May Know Him, August 12. The title of our devotion for today is cultivating the plant of faith. Our key text is taken from Luke chapter 17 verse 5 and it says, And the apostles said unto the Lord, Increase our faith. Amen. I trust that by the grace of God, as you have been following this devotion, this prayer is not necessarily yours in the sense that your faith has not been increasing but that by the grace of God, your faith has actually been increasing and that you have understood, to some extent at least, what it means to have that faith that works by love and purifies the soul. We are looking today at this topic, cultivating the plant of faith. Remember, we have been reading in Review and Herald, October 18, 1898, paragraph 7, that the knowledge of what the scripture means when urging upon us the necessity of cultivating faith is more essential than any knowledge that can be acquired. We cannot have a healthy Christian experience. We cannot obey the gospel unto salvation until the science of faith is better understood and until more faith is exercised. There can be no perfection of Christian character without that faith that works by love and purifies the soul. Amen. And this is what we are seeking for, perfection of Christian character, godliness, godlikeness. But it is impossible to have that unless we cultivate the plant of faith or know how to exercise faith. The word, the word cultivate is an agricultural term. It denotes the nursing of a plant under the best conditions to make the plant grow to maturity and produce fruit. So if we are talking about cultivating the plant of faith, we are talking about nurturing faith in such a way that it will produce the fruit of the promises of God. The previous devotions has already talked about cultivating the plant of faith, but today we want to look at it with respect to something that makes us not to cultivate the plant of faith, which is our feelings. So let's read our devotion. It says, Faith should be cultivated. If it has become weak, it is like a sickly plant that should be placed in the sunshine and carefully watered and tended. The Lord would have everyone who has had light and evidence cherish that light and walk in its brightness. Let's just dwell on this for a while. If you must cultivate faith, you must live in obedience to the light that you have received and then your faith will increase. When we are not living in obedience to the light we have received, our faith cannot increase. We must come to the light and receive the light, and the little light you have gotten, walk according to it, cherish that light, and then you will have more light. And the more you have light, the more you have faith. Continuing the reading, it says, God has blessed us with reasoning powers so that we may trace from cause to effect. If we would have light, we must come to the light. We must individually lay hold on the hope set before us in the gospel. How foolish it will be to go into a cellar and mourn because we were in the dark. If we want light, we must come up into a higher room. It is our privilege to come into the light, to come into the presence of God. We should grow daily in faith in order that we may grow up to the full stature, to the full measure of the spiritual stature in Christ Jesus. We should believe 
that God will answer our prayers and not trust to feel in. We should say, my gloomy feelings are no evidence that God has not heard me. I do not want to give up on account of these sad emotions, for faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Hebrews 11 verse 1 The rainbow of promise encircles the throne of God. I come to the throne, pointing to the sign of God's faithfulness and cherish the faith that works by love and purifies the soul. End of quote. That is, that I may know him, page 230, paragraph 2 and 3. So, two things that I'll get from this reading now. Faith, when we do not have faith and we say we want our faith to increase, then you are to come to the light. You can't just be mourning of, oh, how I don't have faith, Lord, please increase my faith. If you want your faith to increase, come to the light. Somebody who is in the dark and has legs to walk, and you say, I am in the dark, it is your duty to come out of the darkness where to where there is light. So also when we say, I, I, need, I have faith, my faith is very little, it is our duty to exercise faith by coming to the light, by taking God at his word and then fulfilling the conditions so that he would also do his part. We have read things to this effect before when we read from Review and Herald, March 19, 1889, paragraph 2. Let me just read this one. It says, I have a twin sister who seems unable to understand the simplicity of faith. She is afflicted with disease, but she might be a stronger woman if she would lay hold of God in simple faith. I wrote to her saying, Ask anything you will that is within my power to obtain to make you comfortable, and you shall have it. She believed that I meant what I said. She wrote to me about a wheelchair of which she had heard that she thought would be a great blessing to her. One had been selected for her and she wrote with the greatest confidence. Take note, she wrote with the greatest confidence that I would purchase it. How is it that she could believe in my word and yet could not believe in the promises of Jesus? When I write to her, I mean to present the matter in this very light. Now, I've also read of the lady who asked uh, about volume 4 and um, how... She believed that she would get it because she was told that. You see, this is how to exercise faith. It is our duty. You cannot keep mourning, saying, Oh, my faith is little. I don't have much faith. It is your duty to come to the light and walk in the light of God's word. Then your faith will increase. Come up to a higher room. Now, the second thing that we have seen in this reading talks about our feelings. Some of us may say, I don't have faith. The reason is because we are looking at our surroundings as a measure of whether God is with us or not. We are looking at our feelings and based on how we feel, we say God loves me or he does not love me or we, f- we use that to judge whether we are in Christ or not in Christ. But feelings are no evidence that God is not with us. Our, our circumstances, our lack, those things are not evidences that show whether God is with us or not. So let us talk about faith and feeling. You shall receive power, page 129, paragraph 3. It says, You should walk by faith, not by feeling. We do not want a sensational religion, but we want a religion founded on intelligent faith. This faith plants its feet on the eternal rock of God's word. Please understand this. You see, you can have two kinds of feelings, an elated one or a dejected one. Somebody can feel so high planting his feeling on what he believes, on what he imagines, and on that flight, happy flight of feeling, believes that God is with him, yet God is not with him. Why? He is planting his faith on his own imagination and on his feelings, thinking that because I feel good, therefore God is with me. Or measuring God's presence with him, God's acceptance of him, by the external things that are happening to him. Maybe you got a promotion in your job and then you say, God is with me. Or because some other people lost a loved one and you have not lost your loved one, you feel God is with you and God is not with the other person. You are highly mistaken. That is not how to measure faith. It's not by your feelings and by external circumstances. It is rather by planting your feet on the rock of God's word. What has God's word said? Plant your faith on it. No matter how you feel, dejected or elated, That is not what matters. Have you planted your feet on God's word? Then you can rest. 
You see, it continues to say, those who walk by faith are all the time seeking for perfection of character by constant obedience to Christ. The captain of our salvation has given us his orders and we are to yield implicit obedience. But if we close the book that reveals his will and do not inquire or search or seek to understand, how can we fulfill its obligation? We shall be found wanting at last if we pursue this course. End of quote. You know, Jesus said in the book of Matthew 7, reading from verse 21, 22, Now many shall say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, did we not cast out devils in your name and do many wonderful works and miracles? And he said that he will say to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. These people, according to their works and their feeling, think that God is with them and that they were working with him. But Jesus said, I never knew you. They thought by those external things and their feelings, God was with them. But that's not the case. So, we need to understand how to deal with our feelings. Because sometimes, our feelings may deceive us and we think we have faith. Or may make us think that God is not with us and we do not have faith. The best example I can think of, of how to deal with feelings, is Jesus Christ. We have feelings of gloom, sorrow and dejection sometimes. But these feelings are not to be used to mistake faith, our lack of faith or presence of it thereof. It is rather planting our feet on the rock of God's word. When Jesus was on the cross of Calvary, a lot of things happened there to make him think that he was forsaken by his father. So how did Jesus deal with this? Let us read now from the book Desire of Ages, page 753 and downward it says upon christ as our substitute and surety was laid the iniquity of us all he was counted a transgressor that he might redeem us from the condemnation of the law the guilt of every descendant of adam was pressing upon his heart the wrath of god against sin the terrible manifestation of his displeasure because of iniquity filled the soul of his son with consternation all his life christ had been publishing to a fallen world the good news of the Father's mercy and pardoning love. Salvation for the chief of sinners was his throne, was his team. But now, with the terrible weight of guilt he bears, he cannot see the Father's reconciling face. The withdrawal of the divine countenance from the Savior in this hour of supreme anguish pierced his heart with a sorrow that can never be fully understood by man. So great was this agony, that his physical pain was hardly felt. Let that sink in. Jesus hardly felt the nails piercing through his hand and feet and the laceration on his back. Why? Because there was a greater pain that he was feeling. Take note of the word, feeling. And what was the thing, he, the greater pain he was feeling? It was the withdrawal of the divine countenance of his father from him. This was his feeling. How did Jesus deal with this feeling? Well, that was not all. Let's continue. So many other things happened to establish this feeling that God had actually left him. So let me continue reading. It says, Satan with his fierce temptations wrung the heart of Jesus. The Savior could not see through the portals of the tomb. Hope did not present to him his coming forth from the grave a conqueror or tell him of his father's acceptance of the sacrifice. He feared that sin was so offensive to God that their separation was to be eternal. Christ felt. He felt. Christ felt the anguish which the sinner will feel when mercy shall no longer plead for the guilty race. So a lot of feelings are going on here with Christ. He's feeling his father's loss. He's feeling the guilt of sin of the whole world, of the sins of the whole world pressed on him. He's feeling the anguish which the sinner will feel when the mercy no longer pleads for him. So a lot of feelings are going on here. And why I'm going through this is this. In our own experience right now on this earth, a lot of feelings can come to make us think that God has left us. And we need to know how to deal with it by the example of Jesus. So let's go on. It says, It was the sense of sin bringing the Father's wrath upon him as as man's substitute that made the cup he drank so bitter and broke the heart of the Son of God. In page 753, paragraph 3, it says, With amazement, angels witnessed the Savior's despairing agony. The hosts of heaven veiled their faces from the fearful sight. 
inanimate nature expressed sympathy with its insulted and dying author. The sun refused to look upon the awful scene. Its full bright rays were illuminating the earth at midday when suddenly it seemed to be blotted out. Complete darkness like a funeral pall enveloped the cross. There was darkness over all the land unto the ninth hour. There was no eclipse or natural cause for this darkness, which was as deep as midnight, without moon or stars. It was a miraculous testimony given by God that the faith of after generations might be confirmed. Now, when this darkness happened, that there, because the Bible says in the book of Matthew 7, 27 verse 45 that now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. How do you interpret this darkness? Like we read now, it is the miraculous testimony given by God that the faith of all of us might be confirmed. But how did the people in the days of Jesus interpret that darkness? Reading it says, In that thick darkness, God's presence was hidden. Now, Jesus did not see beyond the tomb. He did not know whether his sacrifice would be accepted. In fact, it looked like his father had left him. But God was there in that darkness. And do you know that in the dark days of your life, God is there? Continuing the reading, it says, He makes darkness his pavilion and conceals his glory from human eyes. God and his holy angels were beside the cross. The Father was with his Son, yet his presence was not revealed. Had his glory flashed from the cloud, every human beholder would have been destroyed. And in that dreadful hour, Christ was not to be comforted with the Father's presence. He trod the winepress alone and of the people there was none with him. Hmm. Now, concerning what we just read about the Father hidden in the darkness, was Jesus aware? No, Jesus was not aware of this. All he could see was doom and gloom. There was no external evidence there giving him the assurance that his Father was with him. I'm saying this because sometimes in our own lives, we may be in such darkness of certain experiences that makes it look like the Father and Jesus is not with us. How do we deal with it? Firstly, let us see the wrong interpretation of this darkness. Like we read in Matthew 27 verse 45, it says that there was darkness everywhere. At first, what happened was when this darkness came, the people were afraid like we're just reading now. But later on, the darkness withdrew and it just encircled Christ alone. In Matthew 27 verse 46, it says, And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is to say, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? So let's see the insight as to why Jesus said this. The Tower of Ages, page 754, paragraph 3. At the ninth hour, the darkness lifted from the people, but still enveloped the Savior. Wow, somebody will say, bad omen, this is not normal. Yes, it wasn't normal, but what is your interpretation of it? Look at what it read, what it says now. It was a symbol, that darkness enveloping only Christ and not the rest of the people, was a symbol of the agony and the horror that weighed upon his heart. No eye could pierce the gloom that surrounded the cross. And none could penetrate the deeper gloom that enshrouded the suffering soul of Christ. The angry lightnings seemed to be hurled at him as he hung upon the cross. Then Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? As the outer gloom settled about the Savior, many voices exclaimed, The vengeance of heaven is upon him. The bolts of God's wrath are hurled at him because he claimed to be the Son of God. Many who believed on him heard his despairing cry. Hope left them. If God had forsaken Jesus, in what could his followers trust? End of quote. My oh my. 
Can you imagine the interpretation that this darkness was given? I mean, as human beings, that's what we will say. The darkness surrounded only Jesus. There were thunderings and lightnings surrounding him. And the Pharisees and Sadducees and chief priests are all saying, this is the evidence that he was not a child of God. This is the evidence that God is not with him. God's wrath is upon him. Is that how to interpret things? Of course not. And how about Jesus? How did he feel about this? He felt alone. He felt alone. But later on, the darkness left. It says, when the darkness lifted from the oppressed spirit of Christ, he revived to a sense of physical suffering and said, I thirst. But let us see how the real interpretation of that darkness. It says, in silence, the beholders watched for the end of the fearful scene. The sun shone forth, but the cross was still enveloped in darkness. Priests and rulers looked towards Jerusalem, and lo, the dense cloud had settled over the city and the plains of Judea. The sun of righteousness, the light of the world, was withdrawing his beams from the once favored city of Jerusalem. The fierce lightnings of God's wrath were directed against the fated city. End of quote. So while the people, the, 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 the chief priests and the Pharisees and Sadducees were saying that the darkness is an evidence that Jesus is not the Son of God, the real thing that was happening is that that darkness was showing God's displeasure with them and his withdrawal from Jerusalem and that darkness surrounded Jerusalem also you know sometimes when it looks like things are going ill with us and going well with those who hate the truth consider the case of Jerusalem and think about it again what is really the evidence that Jesus was the son of God it is not the lightning whether they were able to crucify him on the cross does not mean he's not the son of God it is his obedience to the law of God that shows him to be the son of God when Jesus fasted, after 40 days, the devil wanted to use these external things to make him feel like he's the son of God and said, if you are the son of God, turn this stone to bread. It is not the turning of the stone to bread that will make him the son of God. And he's not to feel like he's not the son of God just because he's not turning stone to bread. It is the word of God. God's word that said at his baptism, this is my beloved son and in, in whom I am well pleased. And that is what Jesus depended on. When things are happening around us that make us feel like God has forsaken us, we are not to have let those things have weight with us. We are rather to think on God's word. Ecclesiastes 8 verse 11 to 13 says, Because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. Though a sinner do evil an hundred times and his days be prolonged, yet surely I know that it shall be well with them that fear God, which fear before him. But it shall not be well with the wicked, neither shall he prolong his days which are as a shadow, because he feareth not before God. Amen. What Jerusalem perceived to be the judgment of God on Jesus was not the case. It was God's withdrawal from them and rejection of them as his people. Continuing the reading to see how Jesus dealt with his feelings at this time, it says in page 756, paragraph 2 and 3. Suddenly the gloom lifted from the cross and in clear trumpet-like tones that seemed to resound throughout creation, Jesus cried, It is finished. Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. A light encircled the cross and the face of the Savior shone with a glory like the sun. He then bowed his head upon his breast and died. Amid the awful darkness, apparently forsaken of God, Christ had drained the last dregs in the cup of human woe. In those dreadful hours, he had relied upon the evidence of his father's acceptance heretofore given him. Do you see that? How did Jesus deal with that darkness? There was nothing around him that was showing that God was with him. But he was relying on the evidence that was given to him before. The evidence of God's word that said, This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And the evidence is that God was with him all the way till the cross. Continuing it says, He was acquainted with the character of his father. He understood his justice, his mercy and his great love. By faith, he rested in him whom it had ever been his joy to obey. And in submission, he committed himself to God. The sense of the loss of his father's favor was withdrawn. By faith, Christ was victor. End of quote. Amen. And we also can be victorious by faith. And even when we are in the worst experiences and circumstances, and it makes us feel so gloomy, and we are very much weighed down, these things are no evidence 
that God is not with us. But we are to depend on God's word even in such times. Faith is ours to exercise. Joyful feeling is God's to give. It is not the presence of wealth and comfort or the absence of sufferings and trials that is the evidence of God being with us. It is the doing of the will of God that is the evidence of God's presence with us. The people of God may suffer, be in poverty, be crucified like Jesus, be maligned, insulted, derided, and ridiculed like our Lord. They, on account of this, may feel the pain of these evils. Yet, this is no evidence of their rejection by God or that God does not love them. We are not to let our feelings to rule us. God's word has spoken, and regardless of everything happening around us, we are to believe his word. For example, God's word says that the dead knows nothing, and the living know they will die, and that the dead are dead, they are neither in heaven or hell, there is nothing like ghosts. And when you see a ghost, what are you to do? Trust God's word and say, this is not actually the dead person, this is something else. We are to have faith in God's word and not follow our senses because that's where our feelings come from. When we see with our eyes, hear with our ears, even things that are contrary to God's word, don't follow those things. They may bring in you feelings of joy or terror, whichever the case. As far as it is not in harmony with God's word, that is not faith. Don't follow your feelings. That I may know him, page 230, paragraph 4 and 5 says, We are not to believe because we feel or see that God hears us. We are to trust to the promise of God. We are to go about our business, believing that God will do just what he has said he will do and that the blessings we have prayed for will come to us when we most need them. Every petition enters into the heart of God when we come believing. We have not faith enough. We should look upon our Heavenly Father as more willing to help us than any earthly parent is to help his child. Why not trust him? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Amen. Contemplate this question and let it dispel every feeling that makes you think that after you have fulfilled the conditions of God's word, then God has not yet answered you or is not with you. Take note, we're not just saying feel good or just feel good all the time. No, we're talking about when you have exercised faith in obedience to God and yet you still don't feel good about yourself. You still feel like you are empty. You feel alone. You feel like God is not with you. But yet you are fulfilling the conditions and doing the will of God. In order to cultivate faith, you must climb above your feeling. When you know that you have done what God has asked you to do, your feelings may not change. You may still feel alone like Jesus felt on the cross. External circumstances may point to God's absence from your life, but these are no evidence that God is not with you. Faith is exercised on the word of God and that is your evidence there. The fact that you have done what you were told to do, that is enough. You don't need any feeling to be supplied to you to make you know that God has heard you and he will do what he said he will do. He has heard your prayers and has accepted you. We don't need feeling to validate our acceptance by God. The only thing we need to validate that God has accepted us is to check ourselves and know that we have done what he said we should do. Once we have done that, that is our validation there. We can go on on our way, go about our business and believe that God will do what he said he will do. Eventually, he will supply the joyful feeling for us. I pray that God will help us to indeed cultivate the plant of faith that our faith may increase. Let us pray. Thank you, dear Father, for your words. Thank you for the blessings given to us in this spiritual armor of faith. Teach us, Lord, to exercise it even more and more. Help us, Father. Someone may be in that condition now where it feels like the Lord is not with them because of some terrible ordeal and trial they are passing through. Lord, I pray that you pierce through the clouds, the light from heaven to reach such a person, that they may learn to exercise faith, that even if they may not see the light and they're just surrounded with darkness alone, that we will just exercise raw faith in your word, 
that even though we see no light around us, we know that the Lord is with us because he said it. Teach us to have this kind of faith, Lord, that in the worst kind of feeling, we will still be steadfast and trust in you. In Jesus' name I've prayed. Amen. This message was brought to you by the angel with a strong voice, a ministry dedicated to preparing people to stand true to God and be ready for his imminent return. For more information and free online resources, please visit www.tawas.org That is www.tawasv.org or contact info at tawas.org